Uh, hello, and welcome to another IBSA online meeting. My name is Jimmy Sexton of the Dubai-based Esquire Group, and I am the chief, uh, sorry, the chair of the Middle East Committee of the IBSA. I am delighted to be joined today with Dimitri Zapol of IV IFS Consultants and Ali Kanani of the Swiss law firm Bernard Lawson to discuss corporate redomiciliation in, the, in international business structuring. We will be examining the reasons why companies may need to be redomiciled from one jurisdiction to another, the methods by which they can do so, whether by transfer of legal domicile, place of effective management, merger, or otherwise, along with some practical examples of where such corporate redomiciliation has been effective. For those new to the IBSA online meetings, we have regular weekly meetings at 3 p.m. UK time every Tuesday, hence the name of our Tuesday Club meetings. We keep these meetings to 30 minutes of bite-sized nuggets of information on a variety of current topics. Because the IBSA comprises of entrepreneurs and their professional advisors, these topics range from intellectual property, finance, law, tax, and all aspects of international business structuring. We record these sessions and they are available exclusively to our members on our website. If you'd like to know more about our not-for-profit association, the International Business Structuring Association, please contact Lucy at info at theibsa.org. A final reminder about muting your sound so we don't hear dogs barking and children shouting. So please, without further ado, let me pass you over to Ali to introduce the session. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can uh, all hear me correctly. Um, first of all, and, and before going into the various cases that we have prepared with, uh, with Dimitri for you, um, I, I really want to just put uh, the context of our presentation. And first of all, to give you and to present to you what could be the reasons for a corporation to migrate from one country to another. Um, and uh, I really want to, to share all uh, the, the cases that we dealt uh, with uh, the, in the past uh, years. Uh, and most of the cases that I had to deal with were related to three main issues where I have to, or where the company has to migrate from one country to the other. And the first reason is uh, related to the new international corporate tax environment uh, since BEPS projects, the base erosion and profit shifting project uh, were issued uh, for some five years ago. Uh, and multinational decided at that point to transfer the legal seat of their holding company, for instance, where the economic substance was located. Having a holding company which manages participation in a country where you don't have dedicated office space, no employees, uh, and have only fiduciary directors is no more a good option, I would say, uh, to make it uh, simple. The second uh, main reason that I saw in, in, my, in, in the various cases, the, the, the second uh, reason is, in my view, the extreme transparency that the UA um, the European Union member states achieved with the introduction of the publicly available uh, UBO registers, uh, with almost no exception, even for sound reasons. And in these cases, we, 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 we saw some shareholders uh, looking for confidentiality, even if their assets were completely and fully disclosed to their uh, local tax authorities. Uh, for instance, in one of the cases, we saw shareholders uh, that were under 18 years old who inherited a significant part of a multinational. Uh, you need to protect their identity uh, for their safety, for instance. We also saw some other shareholders that were resident in countries where they may face kidnapping. Uh, and you know, these type of shareholders really want and need to remain discreet. The third reason uh, that uh, I want to uh, share with you is the onshoring of offshore entities that owns a portfolio type of investments or simply a bank account. Uh, these type of structures, is, as you all know, uh, were very, very successful 
um, 30 years back. Uh, and I'm still doing uh, today uh, a voluntary disclosure procedure in, in Switzerland where I have to disclose this type of structure to the tax authorities. And of course, the tax authorities in Switzerland, they want either to tax these companies in Switzerland because they have their effective management in Switzerland, or they want simply that we transfer the legal seat to Switzerland. Uh, and, and this is really uh, the main three issues. In other cases, we also uh, saw some, some uh, companies, uh, they wanted to benefit, for, for instance, from uh, a business investment treaties network. And for that reason, they wanted to, for instance, move to Netherlands or to Switzerland. Um, we, also, uh, we also saw some cases where uh, the group was in need of, uh, to, to reduce their uh, expenses. Uh, their uh, operational costs and um, perhaps or for instance due, um, due to a finance financial crisis and in that in that cases they decided to reduce their presence in in various uh, countries uh, reputation of the the jurisdiction where you have your um, entity could be also uh, you know um, 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 a way or a need to, to change uh, jurisdiction. But now let's see with, with Dimitri uh, what could be the various uh, methods to migrate a company. Thank you, Ali. Hello, everyone. Um, there are a few methods of migrating a company from one place to another. And broadly, they could be split into the actual migration in different ways, which I will cover and migration, which is the actual migration, but coupled together with contractual arrangements. And you will talk more about those. The most popular method, of course, is the so-called transfer of management and control, also known as transfer of place of effective management. Before I start talking about this method, let me give you a bit of a theory. As you probably all know, each country is registered in a particular country and is a creature of national law. However, each such company is also a subject of the local tax law. And it is possible for a country to be tax registered, excuse me, to be registered in one place, but to be tax resident in a different place. Now, broadly countries are split in two different groups. One group is, is the yeah, the countries which, which follow the so-called incorporation theory. These are the UK, United States, Ireland, Switzerland, or the Netherlands. Such a theory says that a company is connected to the jurisdiction in which it has been incorporated, and it remains to be so connected and so registered, even if its management and control moved to a different place. However, there are also countries which um, pursue the so-called real seed theory. Mostly it's uh, the uh, continental law countries, such as France, Germany, Luxembourg, in essence, it means that the tax registration and the actual registration are together. And as soon as you move the tax registration and the, the place of effective management, the, the company loses its legal nature. The reason I'm telling you this is that those companies which are located in countries which follow the incorporation theory, it is perfectly possible to appoint directors in a different country. And while the company will remain registered in one place, it will be tax resident in a different place. If this can be done, of course, voluntarily, and later I will tell you a few examples how and why this should be achieved. However, sometimes this can be done involuntarily. When, for example, the UK revenue authorities see that a foreign company is managed and controlled from the UK, they can force it to be registered for corporation tax in the UK. Another possible method of migrating a company is to re-domicile such company or also to continue it. Again, on the condition that the country from where such company is emigrating is allowing this, then it is possible to take it off the local corporate register and continue it in another country which also allow such inward migration. Typically, it is the offshore countries uh, which allow outward migration, BVI, uh, the, the Bahamas, 
Belize, etc. They allow you to take the company off the corporate register and move it elsewhere. The countries which allow inward migration include Malta, Cyprus, Luxembourg in, in, in Europe, and also I think the United Arab Emirates. Essentially, this allows you without um, dissolving the company, but with continuing its obligations and all its contracts and its good and name to continue in the new jurisdiction without it being dissolved. Now I'll pass it on to Ali, who will cover the rest of the migration methods. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the whole idea of redomiciliation of an entity uh, is to avoid creating tax adverse consequences for the entity of, or, or for the group uh, as, as a whole. And, and therefore, it is very important to find the right method uh, based on factual background. So, for instance, if you are doing a tax neutral restructuring, it is essential to analyze, first of all, in details, the existing accounting, the, the existing accounts uh, of the, the, the entity that you have to migrate, uh, and to assess the tax liability of this company under the target jurisdiction's tax principles. We can also do, for instance, a cross-border merger. And it remains, in my view, uh, in my experience, a, a very simple restructuring from a process point of view, from an administri administrative point of view, and also from a legal point of view. Uh, and by doing a cross-border merger, as, as I was saying when I was talking about the reasons to, to migrate, you can really reduce the, uh, the presence of group in various jurisdictions. For instance, for, for a Swiss point of view, if a company is absorbed by a foreign entity, for instance, by its parent company, uh, it, would, it will be qualified uh, under Swiss tax law as a liquidation of the Swiss entity. But as um, Dimitri was saying, we can still move the company from one place to the other without having a legal liquidation of the company. So, it is very important before uh, deciding on the method that you would like to use to restructure a group. It is necessary to take into account legal and tax consideration uh, in each jurisdiction. And uh, it is also necessary to work with experienced uh, local advisor uh, on legal and tax aspects. And, and really, I mean, by going into the, into the case study, uh, you will see how important it is to take into consideration all these uh, parameters. So perhaps uh, with Dimitri, we can move now to, to the first uh, case study, Dimitri. Yes, thank you, Ali. Um, the most popular case that we've seen in the recent years would be the, it would be migrating a company from an offshore, from an offshore jurisdiction to the onshore. Typically, it would be moving a personal investment company or a holding company from the likes of the BVI or the Bahamas somewhere onshore. Say, in my example, it will be Cyprus or the United Kingdom. From the point of view of the, of the offshore jurisdiction, the process is fairly simple. In the absence of local corporation tax, either on foreign profits or of uh, any taxation of gains which have accrued to the company, it is possible to make such company not tax resident in the offshore country by uh, notifying the tax authorities in the new host jurisdiction that the management and control of such company has been moved there. In practice, it means that, say, the UK tax authorities or the Cyprus tax authorities are notified that a company registered, say, in the BVI is now managed and controlled in Cyprus or in the UK. Typically, this triggers registration for corporation tax or for income tax, the obligation to file returns, and the company becomes a subject of local tax legislation. However, of course, the drawback of such method is that the company still continues to be registered in this original jurisdiction, which requires it to file returns, albeit this could be fairly limited. Why would one decide to pursue such migration? 
Ali has already pointed out a few important uh, factors which we should take into account. Speaking from experience, to begin with, economic substance requirements play a significant role. In the BVI, as you know, you have to maintain the adequate number of staff, premises, and what we call corporate substance to ensure that the company is operational. In the UK, such conditions do not exist. They do exist in Cyprus to a limited extent, however, if the company is not looking to open a local Cyprus bank account, such economic substance requirements do not need to be met. Second of all, as soon as the company becomes a subject of the onshore tax legislation, it becomes party to the applicable tax agreements. Now, the UK has close to 130 double tax agreements. I think Cyprus has maybe around 100. All of this allows the now onshore resident company to receive dividends, uh, interests, or royalties from abroad with a minimum amount of taxation. Now, of course, it is interesting to think what is going to happen in the UK if a company now UK, re, tax resident in the UK, whether it will be able to rely on UK's tax or whether we'll be able to rely on use tax directive, such as uh, parent subsidiary directive, interest royalty directive. It remains to be seen, but thankfully, because of the wide uh, double tax treaty network, we don't think that the effect will be significant. With regards to Cyprus, of course, it has its own benefits uh, compared to the UK. The most important benefit, of course, is the much lower uh, income tax rate of 12 and a half as opposed to 19%. However, just recently I read rather worrying news that I think the local government, or forgive me if I make a mistake in calling the relative, uh, the, the legislative body, but they're thinking of introducing withholding tax on certain payments from Cyprus. And uh, still in the UK, thankfully, would not withhold any taxes on, uh, on dividends and also non-residents do not pay any tax on disposals of UK companies. So I think we will watch the space and see if Cyprus is still better than the UK uh, or not. Also, uh, occasionally companies are used to uh, hold real estate in different countries. And especially uh, some people still use uh, foreign companies to hold UK real estate. It's not time and place to discuss the relative advantages of whether the property should be held through a company or not. Well, let's say that sometimes they do. Now, the revenue, the UK tax authorities are very happy to forcefully drag a BVI re tax registered company in the UK tax net and make it tax resident. So sometimes to preempt this procedure, it is better to make such BVI resident company UK tax resident so that to avoid any uh, negative feelings from HMRC. However, because the company remains registered outside the UK, it is still a valid point for holding UK real estate because for, from the point of view of UK inheritance tax, this uh, brings UK uh, non-residential real estate outside the UK inheritance tax net. Therefore, it is common to appoint local directors and making sure that management and control is exercised from the territory, the company becomes tax resident in the relevant country. I should only say, however, that often foreign countries, which um, uh, where, where payments are sourced and where payments are going, say, to the UK and Cyprus, they may require certificates of tax residents received actually from the UK or from Cyprus. And at least speaking from the UK perspective, it is not sufficient just to say that there's a director operating from the UK. It is absolutely necessary to show that the actual management and control is exercised from the UK territory. And therefore, sometimes clients have to really make an effort to show that the company is effectively controlled from the local territory. I think I've said enough about management and control. Let me talk to you briefly about our experience of migrating a UK company to Italy. This was before my time, before I joined the first consultants. My partner Roy Saunders, I think, executed the first migration of a UK company to Italy, with dissolving the UK company. It's hey, Dimitri, 
Yes. Dimitri, just, just, just to interrupt really quick, we're coming up on uh, uh, 20 minutes after. So if we want to wrap yeah. it up, maybe in like five minutes, so we have time for some I'm questions. I'm almost done. Uh, what I wanted to say is that if you want to migrate a UK company to Italy in our situation, we had to rely on the EU merger directive. Essentially, what this required was to first incorporate an Italian company in Italy. And under the merger directive, the UK company would merge into the Italian company and thus would leave the UK tax net. So in strictly speaking, it's not really, mig it's not really migration, but it achieves the same purposes. The only drawback, of course, of following the merger directive nowadays is that the immigrating company has to keep a permanent establishment in the UK, which sometimes could lead to certain tax difficulties. Now, Ali will tell us the other examples of how migration can be achieved. Yeah, and I also, thank you, Dimitri. I also heard uh, Jimmy uh, saying that uh, we, are, we are running out of time already. Uh, so I just want to focus on one example, which is the transfer of legal seeds from the Netherlands, first to Luxembourg and then to Switzerland. Uh, we did in the past various type of redomiciliation of Luxembourg entities to Switzerland. Uh, we did it uh, through a spin-off of the Luxembourg entity by creating a subsidiary of the Luxco. Um, we also did a contribution from the Luxembourg company to a newly incorporated Swiss entity uh, and we also simply transferred the legal seat from Luxembourg to uh, Switzerland. Uh, and of course, in one of the examples, we had, first of all, a Dutch company who wanted to migrate to Switzerland. But uh, for, for a legal reason, uh, a Dutch company cannot transfer its legal seat outside the country. But of course, thanks to uh, European Union freedoms, uh, this type of Dutch company can transfer its legal seat to a state which is a member state of the European Union. And therefore, the first step was to transfer the Dutch company to Luxembourg. And then as a second step, we migrated the company to Switzerland without liquidation. And this is also to, to, to show how important is it to first analyze the legal and tax consequences of the current juris jurisdiction of uh, the, the company that needs to migrate. And um, of course, we, we can also do uh, the, the same uh, restructuring, transferring the legal seat uh, by other methods. Uh, it could be a contribution, for instance, from the uh, Luxembourg entity to a Swiss company. And by doing so, uh, you will not only be exempt in Switzerland from uh, issuance stamp tax, for example, but, but also from withholding tax of 35% in case you redistribute the assets or part of the assets to the shareholders in, in the future. So really, um, I hope that we, we, we succeeded with Dimitri in giving you, you know, the main uh, cases that we have to deal with. Uh, and to give you an overview of how to migrate uh, a Lux, uh, sorry, not only a Luxembourg company, but a company from one state to the other for various reasons. Uh, and perhaps now we have some, some time for, uh, for questions, Jimmy? Yes, thank you so much for uh, Dimitri and Ali for all the, the valuable information. We do have a couple of questions here. Um, the first one's gonna be for Dimitri. Uh, when a company is migrating through merger into a different country, are there any practical workarounds that would allow it to minimize the tax consequences of having to leave a permanent establishment in the UK? Hi. On one hand, this question is very tricky because the whole reason for having to leave the permanent establishment in the UK is provided by the merger directive. And its purpose is to stop uh, companies just moving around in order to avoid taxation. But if we, we really need to look at the business which is immigrating from the UK in this case. Say for example, if we have a brick and mortar business, uh, it's much, it may be much more difficult to leave the UK completely, not leave behind presence. And in this case, the permanent establishment kind of follows the necessity to leave some physical structure behind. However, if we're talking about some digital business, 
it is much easier to do this. One example we had in the past was a company with large digital assets, which would remain in the UK, thus forming the UK permanent establishment. However, over the years, the actual value of the digital assets remaining in the UK would dwindle. Thus, formally, it would meet the necessary requirements, but practically speaking, it would not lead to substantial tax losses in the future. Unfortunately, this issue is quite difficult, and uh, obviously, there are various anti avoidance rules which prevent you from uh, exercising such techniques. Great, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Ali, the next question is for you. Are there many anti abuse rules that apply in case of a foreign company migrating to Switzerland? Mm. Yeah, I mean, in Switzerland, I mean, we, we faced a, a few discussions during this, uh, this summer uh, for, for a specific case where we, we wanted to move a Luxembourg company to Switzerland. And I don't know if the, the COVID was the reason uh, or, or perhaps uh, other reasons, but, you know, I mean, Swiss tax authorities have many anti-abuse rules that applies specifically for the withholding tax purposes. And I, and I was saying in my, in my case study, uh, where we try to uh, transfer the, the, or to migrate a Luxembourg company to Switzerland by creating these uh, distributable reserves that are not subject to withholding tax. These reserves are created by contribution uh, from uh, the shareholder to its subsidiary. And in this case, uh, Switzerland or Swiss tax authorities at the federal level may apply various uh, anti-abuse rules. And in, in, in that case, it's, it's highly recommended to, to uh, request a, a written tax ruling from the federal tax authorities. Okay. And also in Switzerland, uh, it, does Switzerland have a, uh, a UBO register? And if so, uh, is it public? Yeah, so I was mentioning the reasons why a company may migrate from, from abroad to Switzerland and, or, or from the European Union to Switzerland. That was perhaps the first cases that we, we dealt with. And we have a UBO register obligation in Switzerland, but contrary to the European Union, it's not a publicly av available uh, register. So the company has basically one, one page or document uh, in its uh, corporate uh, files, which stated who are the shareholder, it's the reg uh, shareholder register, and who are the UBOs of the, of, the, of the Swiss entity. And this constitutes the UBO register. So in case the tax authorities need to see it, then they can request it from the company but it's not uh, publicly av available and that really increase uh, the confidentiality aspect uh, for a Swiss company having no parent entity in the European Union. Okay, great, thank you. And I have uh, one other question. I'll, I'll address this one to you, Dimitri. In today's environment of regulation and economic substance testing, what would you consider the definition of offshore to be? That's a very valid question, and perhaps I'm wrong in calling the offshores offshores. Perhaps rather it's a, it's a habit of calling any country without tax there an offshore. If you look at it from the UK perspective, anything outside of the UK is an offshore, to be fair. But uh, I think most people will agree that it is, com it is common name for anything where you don't, you don't pay much tax, although, of course, the question that Alan Cable has asked is absolutely relevant. With economic substance rules, etc., it's difficult to find a pure offshore. Can I just answer the question of Andrew Knight regarding the use of the Societe Europea? Sure. Yeah, uh, Andrew Knight has asked, well, he actually mentioned uh, the fact that it is possible to convert a company to a European company, also known as Societe Europea, and move it around the UK. And Andrew, you, you've made an absolutely correct comment, which I just didn't have a chance to, uh, to cover this issue. And Societe Europea does allow you to move your company around. From experience, I think it's a rather difficult process and quite, and quite uh, riddled with regulation. I think a while ago, there have been ideas to make it much simpler 
to paid private associated European companies, I think, but I'm not sure whether this project has gone anywhere beyond the mere idea. So yes, if you have a large uh, PLC, for example, it's totally possible. If you have enough time to do it, you can also do that. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Thank you for that answer. And thank you, Dimitri and Ali, for joining me in what has been an illuminating discussion. If you joined us late and would like to watch this presentation in its entirety, please visit our website at www.theibsa.org slash events slash videos. And if you would like to become members of the IBSA and are suitably qualified and wish to attend future online meetings, as well as physical discussion group meetings, workshops, and conferences that I hope we will soon be able to hold, please contact our COO, Lucy, at info at theibsa.org. Our next meeting will be next Tuesday, November 10th, where Anthony Turner of Farrer and Company will be co-presenting with Darren Harrisey and Shailen Manek of Simmons Gainsford for a session entitled Assisting Growth Companies with Their Financing and Structuring Requirements. They will review the need for a robust business plan complete with relevant documentation that will be required by initial investors, perhaps those participating in venture capital finance incentives such as the UK's SEIS or EIS scheme, research and development incentives, key management incentives, and second stage financing, including private equity transactions. So until next week at 3 p.m. UK time, goodbye.